Today I'm going to show you my process for painting a band of gaming miniatures. I decided to make a video that's been requested over and over by my friends and by the folks I hang out with in the mini painting community. Today I'm going to show you my process for painting miniatures from start to finish. This isn't really a tutorial since I skip over a few important details here and there, but it'll be a pretty fun video and I'm really looking forward to it. If you're not too familiar with the world of miniature painting, it's kind of a hobby within a hobby. Miniature painting grew in popularity with the game Warhammer, which is a tabletop war game where you build an army of miniature fantasy characters and pit them against other miniature armies. The armies come unpainted in all sorts of different sets, and Games Workshop, the creators of Warhammer, also sold paints, brushes, and other supplies for preparing your army for battle. It's pretty brilliant. This is where mini painting gained its popularity, and since the 80s or so when Warhammer first released, lots of other board games and tabletop games featuring miniatures have been released. These days, you can buy fancy miniatures made for display, or you can use miniatures to play Dungeons and Dragons and other tabletop RPGs, and there are a ton of war games and tabletop games these days that are also sold with unpainted miniatures. Lots of folks even have their own 3D resin printers and print their own models at home for a fraction of the cost of buying them from a store. Even though I initially got into miniature painting by painting some Warhammer figures, I've never actually touched a game of Warhammer. What got me back into miniature painting recently is a game called God Tier by Steamforge Games. God Tier is a tabletop skirmish game for two players. Each player controls up to three champions, along with that champion's minions, to try and plant their respective banners, take out their enemies, score victory points, and use the god tiers to claim immortality. It's a really fun game that's pretty easy to learn but difficult to master. We backed the game on Kickstarter and have since been collecting and painting the warband sets one by one. Each set comes with a champion, three to five minions, and a banner miniature as well as the game cards for that champion, so you can play them in the game right away. As of this recording, I've painted 12 of the Warband sets and have 8 left to paint. My partner and I have a great time playing this game, and I can't wait to paint the rest of the Warbands, because the rule is, we don't play with them until they're painted. So, in today's video, I'll be painting a God Tier Warband from start to finish, and I've chosen to paint the Orc Shaman Rattlebone, Prophet of the Ascended Past, and her Hexling minions. God tier champions come in four different types that all play a bit differently. Slayers focus on killing other champions. Guardians protect their banner and allies. Maelstroms take out enemy minions. And Shapers act in various support roles to their allies. Rattlebone is a Shaper champion who uses her Hex abilities to blight enemies and bolster allies. Before I ever sit down to start painting, the first thing I do is reference color ideas to prepare a color scheme concept. I'll typically reference a combination of the character's concept art on the box and some existing paint schemes done by my fellow miniature painters. I knew that for Rattlebone and her crew, I wanted to incorporate some bright colors into the color scheme, and I was really inspired by this particular paint job by Michael Jordal, whose Twitter I'll link in the description. I liked his use of bright colors without making the minis look too rainbowy, so I adopted a few of his ideas into my own color scheme and created a concept in my digital art software. I won't go into detail here about how I make my color scheme concepts because I've already made a video detailing that process step by step. It'll be linked in the description below if you want to check it out. Once I have a solid concept ready to go, I go and get ready to paint. So my hobby table where I paint minis is not big, fancy, or pretty. It's an old art table in my basement's workshop and laundry area that serves as a multi-purpose table for all of my different hobbies. For now, I of course have it set up for mini painting, which includes a few key items. First the minis to paint, of course, then my paints. I keep all my paints in the far corner and have about 50 or so that are mostly Vallejo model color, with a few Citadel and P3 paints thrown in. 
I tend to do a lot of paint mixing and just buy paint colors as I feel I need them. I keep older paints or paints that I don't expect to use in the little white basket. And in front of the basket, I have two mason jars, one for brushes and one for paint water, and then my wet palette, which I'll set up shortly. The God Tier miniatures are sold pre-built and their plastic is already the color that represents their champion type, which is cool because they're ready to play right out of the box. Since Rattlebone is a shaper class, she was green. The first step before painting I kind of forgot to film, but I washed the minis in some soapy water, let them dry, and then primed them. This prime job is not a good example of how to prime well, and I'll explain what happened. Typically, I prime my minis in black, then do a light dusting of white along the top of the minis to give them what's called a zenithal highlight. I like doing this because it gives my eye a nice clear distinction of the details on the mini and also helps me plan for highlights and shadows as I paint. I prime outside using black and white rattle can primer from the hardware store, nothing fancy. And while it usually gives me really good results, this particular prime job was terrible. The black sprayed on nice and clean as usual, but in the middle of a nice spray of white, my can of primer suddenly started spewing out solid bits of paint mid-spray. I sort of panicked and had to give the minis some emergency bathing and isopropyl alcohol to get those paint chunks off. Thankfully, I was successful and was able to get it all smoothed out again, but it left this kind of horrific zenithal highlight job behind. Not my finest hour in priming, but the primer is still doing its job and I have a plan to fix this up in the first painting step. Anyway, once these folks are all primed up, I use some sticky tack to adhere my minis to painting handles. Painting handles are awesome because they allow me to hold the mini steady without touching it and easily move the mini around in different angles as I paint. You can buy painting handles designed specifically for holding miniatures but I just use old empty vials of beer brewing yeast. You see, my hobby table is conveniently located next to my keg fridge full of homebrew beer, so I consider it a cost-effective and fun way of intertwining two of my hobbies. Next, I prep my wet palette. A wet palette consists of a sponge with a layer of paper on the top, usually parchment paper or something similar. It takes a bit of practice to get the right balance of wetness on the sponge, but once you get it right, the paper on top stays damp and you can apply acrylic paints to the paper and the paint won't dry out. It's really handy for multi-day painting sessions because the paint will stay wet longer and it's a really inexpensive investment that I would recommend to anyone who uses acrylic paints in their hobbying. Once the wet palette is primed, I open up my laptop and get my reference image up on the screen so I can look at it while I paint. I usually prep some music or a podcast to listen to as well. Today it's Casey and Brent from the Paint Bravely podcast that are keeping me company. I'll link them in the description. Now we're ready to start painting. So the first step of actual painting is to apply a layer of base paint to the miniatures. This will lay the foundations for the subsequent steps. When working on the base coat, it's a good rule of thumb to start with the most interior areas of the mini. So in this case, I'll be starting with Rattlebone's green orc skin. I thin the paint down just a little bit with some water to keep it from building up too much on the mini as I apply new layers of paint. Each color usually requires two to three coats of paint for full coverage, but some pigments give more consistent coating than others. The early layers like this green can be a bit messy, but as I continue to add new colors, I start being more careful to only apply paint colors where they're intended to go. Precision is really important in this early step because a cleanly applied base coat will set the precedent for all the other upcoming steps. As part of covering up this awful zenithal prime job, I'm applying a layer of red to all of the areas that will later have red, purple, or yellow paint applied to them, and I'm also adding a layer of blue to all the areas that will have either blue or green paint. Red and blue are both very opaque pigments, allowing me to cover up that primer shame. The first step of basing is completed. It's just green, brown, red, and blue to start with, and now I'm going to move on to round two. In this step, I'm adding some of the secondary colors to the existing base paints. I'm painting a light orange in preparation for the yellow areas, and applying purple and green to the appropriate spots. 
Once I'm finished adding those details, I'll also add a bone white to the skeleton banner and to Rattlebone's bone weapons. Once those secondary colors have all been added, I'll take a small detail brush and add some black paint to all the spots that will eventually have some metallic detail. And that completes the base coat step. As you can see, the minis are pretty boring at this stage. You can't see a lot of detail, and this is probably my least favorite part of the process, but taking your time on this step is really important to make your minis look really good. Now that it's over and done with, we can move on to the more fun stuff that's gonna bring out all the tiny details in these miniatures. So in this next step, we're going to apply shadows to the minis using a technique called wash or washing. To do that, we're gonna apply a special kind of paint that's called, well, a wash. My favorite brand of wash is the Citadel Shade Line. Wash paints have a special formulation that make them more runny than standard paints. To apply wash, I take a smaller brush, load it up with wash, and generously but carefully apply the wash over all the different areas of the mini that I want to shade. The wash is applied over the entire area, and then it naturally falls into the crevices and recesses of the mini, which creates shadow and depth. Sometimes I only use one shade of wash on a mini, but if I'm using multiple shades, like I am with these minis, I will let one shade dry completely before applying another so that they don't muddy each other up. A lot of my wash footage actually turned out really blurry, but that's okay. The wash process is pretty straightforward. And as you can see, the wash step gives the mini much sharper details, but also darkens the overall color of the mini, which we'll be addressing in the next steps. So in this next step, we're going to apply highlights to the miniatures, primarily using a technique called dry brushing. You can buy special dry brushes, but I usually just use these old size zero brushes with the tips snipped off. Thanks to Midwinter Minis for that awesome recycling tip. To dry brush, I use a paint that's a slightly lighter shade than each base paint, and put just a little paint on the brush, wipe most of it off, and lightly whisk the remaining paint across the raised surfaces of the mini. Doing so leaves light highlights on only the raised surfaces, creating highlights and giving the mini further visual depth. You can see what I mean here on Rattlebone's face compared to the rest of her. The face now has pronounced detail in both the recesses and on the raised edges, giving a much more defined detail to the face. So I continue along with this method, applying a dry brush to raised edges. For some areas, instead of dry brushing, I'll use a small paintbrush to apply highlights by hand. The reason for this is that dry brushing can be a bit imprecise and messy, even if you're careful, so I mostly save it for larger areas and do the smaller areas by hand. When dry brushing, I put a strong emphasis on edges that I think the light would hit, and a bit less of an emphasis on the lower areas that would be in more shadow. I really take my time with this step, mostly to make sure that I don't get any errant dry brush marks on the wrong places. Another notable spot where the dry brushing looks really great is on the Hexley masks, where I used light coats across a broad area to give the mask an old wooden effect. Once I finish the dry brushing and highlight details, I can move on to adding a few more fine details to the miniatures. So in this step, I add even more fine details that will really give these minis a finished look. Keen-eyed observers will notice that I added the yellow paint between these two steps and forgot to film it, but I promise that you didn't miss much. It was just me adding layer after mind-numbing layer of low pigment yellow to the bright orange areas of all the minis. Anyway, now we're adding some old school Citadel chainmail paint to the areas I painted black in the base coat step. I'm using a very small brush to very carefully dry brush the metallic paint over the black. I also use a dry brush to apply metallic effects to the shoulder armor. Like before, I'm using the larger dry brush because I have a broader area to cover, and I'll go back in afterwards with a smaller brush to add the finer details. The metallic paint really makes this miniature shine, literally, and helps add a significant visual interest to the minis. I continue adding metallic effects to the Hexling Pals, and once again, you'll see that it really pulls their look all together. The last part of this step is Rattlebone's face. You'll notice I did the eyes off camera, 
This is because eyes are the bane of every mini painter's existence. It's so hard to get them to look right and to paint eyes requires some intense concentration and steady hands. I also hold the mini really close to my face when I do eyes, so it's not very friendly for filming. Anyway, with that done, we have one final step to add just one more layer of depth to these minis. This is a technique called pin washing, and for this step, I pull out the wash paint again, but this time, instead of brushing it over the entire mini, I'm using a very small brush and focusing on specific recesses and areas that I would like to have a little more shade. This brings some of the dry brush areas down by a shade or two and adds a little extra contrast to the piece. Not all mini painters do this step and of course it's entirely optional, but I really like that it contributes a bit more shadow and contrast to the overall look of my minis. And much like the dry brush step, I noticed it most prominently in the Hexling masks as it allowed me to darken the eye holes and the crevices around the raised dry brush edges to give a really nice contrast to the faces. So now that the minis themselves are basically complete, it's time to address the bases, which up until now have been intentionally neglected. First, what I want to do is add a very simple base layer of paint to the base before I start adding materials and more paint on top. For this, I've been very excited to use this particular shade of puke that's been waiting to rise to the occasion. I apply a layer of paint, being very careful not to get any on my fully painted minis. Unlike the base paint step, I'll typically only do one layer of paint here, since it'll mostly be covered up by basing material and other paints. I just really wanted to finish covering up my terrible prime job, and I have a specific plan for the rim of the base, so it will be painted last. This color is pretty terrible, but because I'm planning a swampy base, I promise this is going to work out. Time to move on to the basing material. For all of the god tier miniatures specifically, I have a method that I've been using for all of them that uses three materials. The first one is coarse sand that I got for a couple of bucks from the craft store, army painter swamp tufts, and aquarium rocks that were $4 at the pet store. Since these are miniatures that are frequently handled on a game board, I need to make sturdy bases that aren't going to fall apart if I look at them wrong. I start out by choosing a few small rocks for Rattlebone's base, and using a little bit of crazy glue, I glue them in random spots on the base. After that's dry, I apply some white craft glue that's been watered down a bit to all of the flat areas of the base. I sprinkle sand on the wet glue, shake off the excess, and ensure that I have full coverage on the base. Then I'll grab a toothpick and use it to very gently pick stray grains of sand off of the model itself and the rim of the base to make sure that there's no errant grains where there shouldn't be. Once it's all tidied up, I leave this to dry overnight. Once it's dried, I take out the wash yet again, and I apply a dark brown wash sparingly and randomly over about half the base. I plan on making this base look like dense swampy greenery, so I plan to do a base wash of green and brown. I also apply brown wash to the rocks, and once this brown wash has dried completely, I come back in with the green and apply it in the empty areas, overlapping the brown just a little bit to ensure good coverage of all that beachy colored sand. Once those wash layers have completely dried, I go back in with my trusty dry brush and apply some paint that's light green mixed with bright yellow along the tops of the grain of sand. This gives the illusion of some ground and mossy green earth. While I'm at it, I also apply a light gray dry brush to the rocks. The final touch on these miniatures is the rim. First, I paint a layer of white around the rim to make sure that the color I put on top is nice and bright. As I mentioned before, in God Tier, the type of champion you play is important to your strategy. And now that we've played the game a lot, we've learned that knowing the champion types at a glance on the board is very important. So for all of my God Tier models, I paint the color that represents their champion type around their rims. Red for slayers, blue for guardians, yellow for maelstroms, and green for shapers. And for fun, I tried to choose a green that matches the color of the green that the minis are manufactured with originally, so I went with a bit of a lighter green. At this point, I turn the minis over to my partner for a quick review to make sure he's also happy with them, which he almost always is, and then I get ready to varnish the minis. To varnish, I simply paint on a layer of Liquitex matte varnish, 
I take my time and spread a nice clean layer over the entire mini. A lot of folks will spray their minis to varnish them, but I had this huge bottle of matte varnish from some old projects, and I kind of enjoy that final process of painting over my mini with varnish. The matte varnish will be completely clear when it dries, and most importantly, it will protect all of that work I did on the painting while we're playing the warbands on the game board. Once the varnish has dried completely, I apply a few Army Painter Swamp Tufts to Rattlebone's base, and a few to the Minion bases, and to the banner for a little extra flourish. The very last step in the process is setting the stage for some glamour shots. If you'd like some tips on photographing your miniatures, I've already made a great little video on the topic that I'll link in the description. I love taking the final photos of the minis and showing the finished product to my friends and my mini painting communities. It's so satisfying. And that's it. That's my entire miniature painting process from start to finish. I really hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned a few tips along the way. This is my first time filming a mini painting video and aside from a few obvious hiccups, I had a lot of fun with it. This is also the first live footage video on my channel. My live filming setup consists of my smartphone and two little daylight bulbs, so I've been a bit hesitant to make live videos like this, but I think it turned out pretty okay and I learned a lot for when I make the next one. If you'd like to see more mini painting videos or just more videos of me doing stuff at my hobby table in general, feel free to let me know. I have more videos on the way, so please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more content like this, and I always welcome suggestions for future videos. Thank you so much for watching today, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!